Welcome, uh, friends, for the afternoon session of the workshop. I find that we are fewer than we started off in the morning. Those who left are called dropouts. <laughs> in every course of study, we have dropouts. In the morning session, I explained to you the purpose of accessing ourselves and the basic technique. The basic technique is simple, that you concentrate your attention on yourself. The rest are all peripheral explanations of how it can be done, what else can be done. Uh, one of the important things to remember is that human attention, which we want to use for the purpose of withdrawing attention to ourselves, that human attention responds most to hearing and next to seeing. Listening is the most natural perception we have. Some people say, no, the eyes are the most important sense organ. Yes, the eyes are the most important sense organ. I'm not talking of the physical sense organs. I'm talking of consciousness. In consciousness, the most important aspect of consciousness in its perceiving capacity is the perception of sound, of listening. Now, I once made a big statement and it went into great controversy in the 70s in speaking in New York at a more or less scientific group, not a spiritual group, when I said that all our perceptions ultimately are translated into the mind by being converted into sound signals. That whether we smell a rose or we see a thing or we hear a message or we touch a thing, it all is interpreted by the brain, by the mental process, only through the listening post of consciousness. They're all converted into sound signals. So they wouldn't understand, how can that happen? And then I asked them to look back into their own lives. When you look at a chair, how do you know it's a chair? When you look at a chair, what happens? You tell yourself, there's a chair. You never know it's a chair till you have told yourself there's a chair. You listen to your own words, there is a chair, before the visual symbol of a chair becomes a chair. The brain will not make it a chair, just make it a pattern with some color. What makes all these different sense perceptions into meaningful symbols and we make life out of them is that we have a constant interpreter of all perceptions into sound signals, and that is our own mind. The mind, in order to perform this interpretative function, constantly chatters in our head, constantly telling us what we are doing, tells us whether we like it or not. We look at a chair and say, there's a chair. Who cares? We know it. It still tells us there's a chair. If we know it, he'll say, there's a chair as you know it. It doesn't stop. The mind as a chatterbox is a continuous speaking mechanism. Now, do, do all living things speak? Not necessarily. But all rational living things, all living things with discrimination speak. All human beings speak. All the human beings who have discrimination, so-called free will, they have to have a speaking mind. If you didn't have a speaking mind, you couldn't be having any free will. The illusion of free will that we are free to take decisions is only possible if the mind is constantly chattering and speaking in your head and telling you, you may do this, you may not do this, I don't think it's right, I think it's right. And we don't consider that somebody is speaking to us. We feel we are thinking about it. That we are thinking about these things to make a decision. We just think about, we are thinking about something all the time, including thinking about what we are seeing what we are hearing, what we are touching, what we are tasting, what we are smelling, what we are doing. We are thinking about all this all the time. This thinking about it is constant repetition. And that constant repetition comes in the form of mental sound signals, which we hear. As we listen to the thoughts in our own head, we put our attention to what we hear. Sometimes we put very little attention, 5%, 6% of our attention we give to these signals. And we come to know there's a chair, there's coffee, there's donut, there's Clarence, there's so-and-so, there's jewel. We come to know, give all the meanings, and we have quick calculations. Who is who doing what? 
who robbed who, who hurt who, everything, who loves who, all the gossip, everything comes quickly through the simple process of listening to our own thoughts. So this built-in mechanism makes listening the most important device we have to have any experience of creation at all. Though it looks like to experience creation, we should be able to taste it, smell it, touch it. But all these become experiences when we listen to what we are doing. If we don't listen to what is happening, then they become abstract signals which mean nothing. The listening interprets them. This is a very interesting development in our knowledge about consciousness, that listening is the key to our experience, because then now we can use it in meditation. We can use it in withdrawal of attention. We can use listening as the device for withdrawing attention. We can listen rather than speak. We can listen rather than see. We can listen rather than do. And we'll be closer to ourselves. Because when we speak, we may be hearing our words in the echo. When we touch, we may be touching something at a distance. When we listen, it has to be us. There's nobody else. It has to be the self. Listening is the secret of the soul. You know that uh, you've often asked me the question, what's the simplest definition of soul and mind which would distinguish the two? The simplest is this. In our head, what speaks is the mind, what listens is the soul. As simple as that. If you fine-tune your listening, you are more spiritual and less mental. If you fine-tune your speaking, you are more mental, less spiritual. It's a very simple division. How do you use the mind to listen by making the mind say something and then listening to it? Which is the basis of all mantra. Mantra is making mind repeat certain words which you can then listen to. Then you don't have to listen to the other garbage and other rubbish that the mind is coming up with. You introduce to the mind certain set of words and say, mind, repeat them. And as the mind repeat, you listen. As you listen to the mind repeating, your attention gathers to the listener. If your attention is gathering to the listener, you are withdrawing attention to the self and your meditation is good. People who have been using mantra, repetition of words in their meditation and have concentrated on saying it loudly, speaking it in a certain way, singing it out, have not had such good results as people who have been intently listening to what they have been saying. So the correct use of a mantra is to repeat words which you can listen to attentively. All right, which is the best mantra in the world? The best mantra is an unspoken language, an unwritten language. It cannot be written, it cannot be spoken. And that is the inner resonance, a sound which can be described as a resonance. The resonance of the spirit itself, which resounds like there's an echo effect, there's a, like the pealing of a bell, like the sound coming from afar, like breeze blowing through a big hall, like a train passing over a big covered railroad station. Those kinds of echoing sounds which are constantly inside us. Some of them are biological sounds, our own heartbeat, our pulse, our breathing, they create the sounds. And some of them are totally unrelated to our bodily functions, such as the sound of a bell. The little bells tingling, ting, 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 ting. You hear this suddenly here, or chirping of crickets, or, uh, or, or some su such sounds with very quick uh, frequency, which have nothing to do with the rest of the biological functions. When they come and we listen to them, it's as good as listening to a mantra. Because you listen with the same soul, with the same spirit. Therefore, if you get something in yourself, in your consciousness to listen to, without having to train the mind to speak, nothing like it. So mantra number one is our own internal sound. Fortunately for us, the creator, by a natural process, has put this sound in all of us. This sound called Shabad, called the word, called Nad, called by so many names, called Logos, has been there 
since human beings were created and is in each one of us it rings resounds inside holy people amongst mid in the in the heads of mystics it resounds in criminals it resounds in dacoits and robbers and killers it doesn't spare anybody this sound is in the head of everybody all you have to do is to withdraw your attention to the third eye center the sound will come you can listen to it if the sound comes and you listen to it your problem of mantra is over that is the mantra if you cannot reach that point or have not yet reached the point then you can use a temporary mantra temporary use of a word or a number of words to repeat almost mechanically clockwise you repeat those words so that you can listen to them you don't repeat those words because they are magical words and by repetition you are getting anything if they were all the buddhists would have gone way far away above all of us because they have the prayer wheel all the words are written on that and every time they swing like that they have said the words a thousand times some new ones have come up with new gear systems and they move even faster and they do like this some are getting motorized wheels you just press the button and there they have done all the meditation needed but these are superstitions the their consciousness is not involved in that the superstition it is just to go astray from the spiritual path to think that these little tricks can train our mind to to get steady and our soul to listen these things don't work and it hasn't worked they are still in the same trap but to be able to listen to the words of mantra is a useful device for going within and for finding your own self how many of you here have a mantra words which you can use okay how many of you know mantra at all they don't know any words to use so you all have some words if you do not have any words to use you can coin your own words i'll tell you the definition of a good mantra definition of a good mantra is it shouldn't make any sense if it makes sense then the sense it makes is supposing i say my mantra is shaky ji old pizza i get take it as a mantra i love that pizza used to shaky doesn't make so good now But supposing i say shaky's pizza is my mantra it makes sense to me and the more i will say shaky's pizza shaky's pizza i am sure of putting my attention on that pizza and never going in i can't take up a mantra that makes sense to me in one of my external physical ex- experiences and thereby tie myself up to that experience therefore i have to select words which do not make any sense to me in terms of an experience of this empirical physical world outside yet it should make sense that this repetition i can listen to with affection and with attention that's the definition of a good mantra very difficult for us to make our own mantra that is why we go to masters and gurus and others and ask them please give us a mantra some words to speak and they give us their own words and we love them because the man gave it we like the man's face we may like his beard we may like his hairstyle we may like his orange colored robe or white robe or whatever he wears and we say oh he gave me this mantra boy isn't it powerful we are associating their personality and yet it makes no other sense except that man whose teaching is to go within and so when we repeat those words if we have any association with those words the association is to go within that makes makes it a proper mantra for our use if you haven't found that white robed man yet or the bearded man i have found a good bearded man beautiful white beard i can never forget if you haven't found one who can give you that kind of a mantra yet then you can make a mantra which may make sense in the context of an inner experience may make a spiritual sense for example you can have a mantra which expresses love in its purest form if you have a mantra which expresses your love in the purest form it is a spiritual mantra to repeat that a short statement to repeat that is as good as repeating a regular mantra so those of you who do not have a mantra already for the exercises we'll be doing now you please coin your own personal mantra for the time being and hopefully one day you'll have a mantra which is not have not has to be coined like this 
is not a makeshift mantra but lasts you for a long time. The object of this mantra is that you should speak it out during the meditation when you want to be at the third eye center. These things are done in stages. First is to recognize that area which we call third eye center. To recognize that that is where our consciousness is operating from in the wakeful state. To be there. To be there, you try to hold on to that position by awareness of the surroundings, awareness of the body, the head. And then, because the thoughts are coming in the way and taking you away from that location, to substitute the thoughts by repetition of these words. Instead of listening to your thoughts, listen to these substituted words of mantra. That helps a lot. The more intently you listen, greater intensity you show in listening. You, want, you can listen simply, or you can listen more carefully, you can listen intently, every syllable, very carefully. The more intently you listen to every syllable of the mantra, the more valuable it is. Because the benefit is not coming from the word. The benefit is coming from listening. The benefit is coming from concentrating your attention on the listener. The listener is the self. So the more intently you listen to it, the more effective will be this mantra. Shall we try it out? Ready for it? Okay, make your own mantra or use the one you already have. Close your eyes and sit comfortably in the third eye center. Behind the eyes. Keep awake, conscious of the center. Close till I count five. One, two, three, four, five. Open your eyes. Open your eyes at the side. That's good, Jewel. Anybody else felt good too? Thank you. It's a good, good progress. Any questions on what we are doing and why we are doing it? Any questions? Any difficulties? Yes. I'm still just not really sure what to expect. Like if I'm supposed to be, when I go into myself, I'm expecting some great answer to come to me. Don't have any expectations, then you'll get all the answers. You heard that before. <laughs> when we expect, we block the answers. Don't expect anything, just be there. Let what has to come, come by itself. Yes. Okay, when you're in the center and then your voice, your whole voice is going like, are you in the center? <laughs> Pretty good. How else will you center yourself? That's the only way we have. Constantly, constantly comment upon it. Are you in the center? Move forward, move backwards. Yes. Then I, so I'm meditating even though I'm doing it? Or I mean, I have to get there first. Yeah. Yeah, do that first. Well, what if you sit and that's all you do? Like, I've been doing that for an hour. It doesn't matter. Some people have done it for years. <laughs> and I've never considered that to be a waste of time. <laughs> it depends on how, how quickly you can locate yourself in the center. That's important. Because if you... Supposing you don't locate yourself in the center and move on to the next step, you could be doing other things for years without having any result. And if you move to the center and then do, you'll have results quickly. So you don't uh, lose time one way or the other. So it's better to be in the center and then move on to the next step. Yes? Uh, just wondering, if you are in the center, it doesn't necessarily mean or it doesn't necessarily mean that you'll automatically hear the sound. Or does it? Automatically. So you disappointed a lot of people here. <laughs> yeah, you got to be real. Because uh, we do not know how to be in the center by withdrawal. We know how to be in the center by focus. 
That's a, that's a shift we have to make in our technique, meditational technique. The shift required is from the process of focusing your attention on things, you withdraw attention to yourself. That takes time. Until you withdraw to yourself, sound really doesn't come. Yes? I sometimes think that I may spend the rest of my life never getting to the center. It doesn't, it doesn't seem like I'm getting closer to the center now than I was five years ago. Um, I've never heard the sound at the point of death, but I've tried for years and years. And that struggle to, to, to get to the center. What happens to me then? I want to give answer in two parts. One, I remember a friend who hadn't heard a sound for years. And later on when I told him what the sound was like, he said, you mean that I've been hearing all these years? I didn't, I thought it'll, it'll be a sound like the other sound that you were talking of. You mean that is a sound? That sense of awareness and hollowness which you talk is a sound? That echo is a sound? And that feeling of a roaring thing, you mean that's a sound? I didn't know that. I was having that for years. So be sure when we talk of sound, we are not talking of physical sounds. The second thing is that uh, sound is not the only uh, explanation of being in the center or close to the center. There are many other things that happen too. For example, you get your answers. You have to move on to the center to know more and more about yourself. More and more of the hidden answers of your own nature come up before you even before you hear the sound. So that you are approaching the center itself has so many other signs and signals. You cannot merely say, if you wait for five years, no sound has come that you've made no progress. You may have made enough progress. I don't want to disappoint people, but the fact is that if one can achieve this in a lifetime, it's pretty good rate of progress. To be able to reach the center in one lifetime is not a slow progress at all considering the state of our mind and considering the distractions we are facing, considering how many chains we have tied ourselves with and how each one requires breaking before we reach the center. It's not, uh, it's not, a, uh, not too much of a time taken. Yeah, people say that, uh, you know, they heard the sound, the sound that was taking them, the time of initiation, they hear the sound. Attention is always there. We don't have to slip. We don't have to slip attention back. We don't have to slip attention back. Attention is flowing from there. We just don't let it flow the way it does normally. There is no process of putting attention in the center. That's a mistake. That's the mistake. It's like focusing attention. We don't say, well, I was able to put some of my attention in the center so I heard the sound. It doesn't happen like that. You were able to withdraw attention from other things that were happening and you heard the sound. So withdrawal of attention is diversion of attention from other things automatically does this. Second thing is that uh, when you have practiced listening to the sound in meditation for a reasonable time, the sound doesn't go away whether you are meditating or not. It's a continuous process. You hear it all the time. You hear it even with very little attention. You can attend to your other work, it's still there. You can hear it because you find out what it sounds like. And sometimes you may not know what it sounds like. Once you find out what it sounds like, you may recognize it. It's always there. In other words, if you're giving uh, the human condition, consciousness is giving attention, uh, putting attention on whatever, person or job or duty or to, uh, to separate that, that conscious attention, talking to somebody and the sound current is going on, or if you're doing some duty and the sound current is going on, but she's got your full attention in that duty, then it would seem like that, that attention is separated. We have never given full attention to anything. We have not even given 1% of attention to anything. All the duties we are performing with, are with less than 1% attention. 
we don't use attention it is like using all the available power of the brain we use very small fraction of it you can do all your job all your responsibility with the maximum efficiency with about 5% attention and be aware of the rest and you will hear the sound while doing everything thoroughly to your satisfaction that nothing has been missed the two don't clash with each other let me give an example to to illustrate the point i am making can you imagine use power of imagination as an example can you imagine that there is a man standing here in front of this podium can you imagine it can you see him does he obstruct your vision you can't see me while you're seeing him you can see both is it transparent how when you imagine a person solid person in front he has no holes in him he is not transparent he is not invisible he is in front here and you can still see me behind how does that happen you are not seeing him invisible or outline or hollow or with holes you are seeing him full and yet through him you can see me too there is no clash the two are totally different dimensions in which you are seeing right now you are seeing in two different dimensions similarly supposing you are listening to the sound say the bell sound is coming so loud that you never heard those bells before and i drop a little pin here you'll be able to hear that too there is no conflict is not the same they are in totally different dimensions this is i have given example of vision and of sound the same applies to attention you could give your total attention to the best of your ability it will not distract your attention from the sound they operate in different dimensions one doesn't block the other you are not creating a physical sound if you created physical sound it would obstruct if you created a physical man in front of me it would obstruct if you create a physical sound it will make it impossible to hear a pin dropping but when the other sound is not physical the other vision is not physical it does not conflict so you can see both you're hearing the sound and uh, you know it's moving or banging or whatever and you hear physical sound then it will interrupt that sound no even a even a whisper will not interrupt once you begin to enjoy that sound nothing interferes in this worldly sounds that you hear to stop it it's not based upon the extent of the sound it's not on the decibels of the sound it depends on the distribution of attention and the attention the scope of using attention for this is so large look at these mystics the plms they come and live amongst us we are talking to them and we think they are giving all their attention to us while we are they are talking to us they are doing so much work in so many other dominions at the same time if attention was a limited thing like we know about it they wouldn't be able to do it but all that is done in different dimensions and doesn't clash with each other well each case is different sometimes you hear the sound as a sample <laughs> you know you want to buy something <laughs> in a store he says excellent candy bring the price i'll give you here's a sample <laughs> and you eat the candy and say boy that's good why can't i get some more i got some i never paid anything for it sometimes you get a sample sound sometimes in fact there is something that we do go wrong and that is we try to try to hear it that's going wrong just like i was talking about expectation when you expect to have an answer the answer never comes when you expect to hear the sound the sound never comes if you hear the sound when you not didn't expect and then you expect to keep on hearing it goes it disappears because expectation moves you away from the center a state of non expectation keeps you in the center so that is why i keep on saying don't follow anything don't try to pursue anything let it come to you if you are in the center all this comes to you automatically yes are, are those kind of practice sounds aren't they physiological some of them they think like i might be at work or doing something involved and i i just figure it's probably physiological to start hearing something some are physiological <laughs> well i had a hard time myself as a child i used to hear a strong bell ringing and i said well somebody is probably at the door doing it except that when i thought it is on the other door it started ringing there that convinced me it couldn't be physical 
how could a person run around to different doors based on where I start thinking? And I would think it's coming from that door, it will come from that door. When I started thinking it's coming from the other door, it started coming from there, it meant it wasn't physiological. So there are some tests you can apply, but sometimes it may be physiological. Once we had this in a session, I asked a man to keep on ringing the bell. So I asked the people in the meditation session, did you hear the bell? He said, of course we know that man was doing it outside. They had no problem. Because that sound is not like the sound in meditation. And they knew it. Yes, uh, this side. No, that is physiological. And don't try to make it up. Okay. It'll come by itself. It's, this is physiological. Yes, another question, Dwight? Yeah, it was just, you know, on a sound again. When it comes to the variance, variations, is that, uh, why does it come in different variations? Because it comes from different parts of our levels of consciousness. There's separate sound from each level of energy center, there's separate sound from, even at the eye center, there's a separate sound if our attention is focused close to the eyeballs just outside. As it moves backwards, the sound is different. As the attention moves backwards to the center, the sound keeps on changing. As it moves upwards in the head, it changes. Different regions, different experiences have different sounds. So the variations are there. So the variation, when the variation comes, you could be um, a person, be anywhere in terms of um, uh, where the consciousness is, is, is actually concentrated. Yes, you could be anywhere. Yes. So in other words, if you, when you're doing the song and then it's resonating all the time, you, you accept that. The resonating sound could be different. It could be changing. Even in meditation. Yes. Wow. You never told us that. I'm telling you now. <laughs> It's not too late. So Is it? Hear, okay. You hear the crickets <laughs> once, then you hear bells, another time, then you hear roars, another time, then you hear big sighted booms, another time. So, this is the very, in other words, these variations give you, uh, depending on where you are. Yes. Now, not only where you are, also where you happen to be because of karma. I should also mention that, that's another variant, <laughs> variable in this, that we are here in this life having certain incidents happening. Events are happening in our life which we, some, some of them we think we programmed, but many of them are coming without our knowledge. We don't know when we programmed it. We fall sick, we get healthy, we eat certain kind of food, we travel, we marry, we have children, and things happen and we don't even know how it's all going on. And who is responsible for these events? Accidents take place. The truth is that when we are born, we are born with a package of destiny. And the package of destiny has its ups and downs, almost like a sine curve. Nobody has a straight up. If you had a straight up, you wouldn't be in the physical world. Nobody has a straight down. If you had a straight down, you wouldn't be in the physical world. To be human in the physical world, you have to have a combination of ups and downs. And that is how in every human life, there are ups and downs of destiny coming up. These ups and downs of destiny affect our sound during meditation. So it's not only where we are in terms of our meditational practice, it also depends on where we are at that time in our karmic pattern. So both of them combine to create these variations. So the karmic package, the karmic package is on the sound of the sound of Yes. There are 10 separate practice sounds before we reach the real sound. These different sounds that we hear are sounds for practice so that we can center ourselves with the practice. These 10 sounds, none of them is the real sound which creates experience. The real sound and its power of vibration creates consciousness and experience. The real sound is the creator of conscious experience. 
So that comes much later. The 10 practice sounds are the sounds that we talk of, the roaring and the little bell sound and the big bell sound and so on. But the big bell with a long peal is the first real sound which has the power to pull you and sweeps you off your feet and takes you into a new dimension just by hearing for a few seconds. That comes later and that is the real sound, the word, the nod that we talk of, which is the creative power that creates everything, that creates conscious experience. But the other sounds, 10 practice sounds, they also gradually lead us to the real sound. And as we hear the sounds and we want practice to reach the real sound, we are advised, if you don't hear any sound, hear anything that you can. If you start hearing different sounds and you can pick and choose, that means focus your attention on one or the other, then move more and more towards the bell sounds. Sounds that chirp, the sound that become like little bells, the sound that become like bigger bells, and the sound that becomes like the peeling of a big gong. Pick up those if you can, you'll move towards the big sound. So why are there 10 11 They could have been 12 too. Just, a, just an accident. Why, why not 10? Why the 10 commandments is not 11? Why not 10? Why are the 10 commandments? Well, I'm also asking. I'm asking counter question. I'm asking counter question. Why are the 10 commandments? Why not 11? Could have been 11. I went and saw a play, in, a naughty little play in, uh, called Oh Calcutta. I was very fascinated. Here's a, here is a play about my country. There's hardly anything about Calcutta. Didn't, didn't name, didn't name Mother Teresa at all. It is so far removed from Mother Teresa that play in New York Broadway. But in the play they gave an answer. When somebody asked, why do you call it O Calcutta? And the person said, well, we can call it O Bangkok. <laughs> so what? We just happened to call it that way. So the fact that we have 10 sounds is just because it is 10 sounds. There's no particular reason why it is 10. And there's no particular, there's particular detriment done if it were 8 or 12. So this just happened to be 10 practice sounds. I suppose uh, considering the, the love for variety that human beings have, 10 is a fairly good number. You can look at coincidences of this kind. There are uh, some people who are constantly looking for coincidences of numbers. Some are able to explain the whole creation from these coincidences. But I, I don't go into that school of thought. I don't believe that just by the numbers we should be able to explain everything. I want whatever the numbers represent. Let's use them, go in and find the truth and find the reality. Not get just uh, bogged down by the beauty of this coincidence. Any other question? Yes. It seems like there's just this tremendous resistance in my to meditation. And is that something that always stays? Is my like always going to be like that? Or is that just a karmic thing? Or is that something you're not supposed to intervene on? The mind is designed to resist based on a very simple principle. The principle is called the principle of survival. What is it called? Survival? Survival. So, survival. survival principle. That everything that is existing wants to survive and the mind wants to survive. When you do meditation of this kind, you are attacking it. And mind has to fight for survival. It fights for survival. On the other hand, do a different meditation. A different kind of meditation in which you encourage the mind and do what the mind wants. It will never resist. You want to do meditation to find your spiritual soul against the attempts by the mind to distract you by other thoughts. It's very hard and tough. You change it and say you want to do Simran and meditation and repetition of nice goodies that your mind can get. In the one first case, you may have a hard time, you become restless after 10 minutes. In the second case, you can sit comfortably on the same chair for two hours without having any of the aches and pains in the bones and the joints, which you would have if you're trying to resist the mind. So the mind is doing its own job of survival. Because you are trying to say, I want to find myself separate from what the mind is trying to do. So that is why the mind does its own job. But uh, the saints and mystics have really bowed before the mind. They said, mind, 
we like you. You are doing a better job than our disciples. If you have been asked to resist, you resist perfectly, consistently. And look at our disciples. They sometimes do meditation, sometimes they don't. So at least we can learn a lesson from the mind. When we see the mind doing resistance so consistently, we can say, thank you, you gave me a good tip. I am going to do my job the same way. So the same mind which is coming in the way can become a good object lesson or consistency in doing our own work. Our own work is meditation. How do you do that second type? Where you don't get tired? That's if you follow whatever the mind wants. Keep on repeating, my mind wants to go on a trip, my mind wants to buy these things. Man. Keep on repeating that, you'll never get tired. You, If you just keep on repeating, whatever your mind wants to do, you never get tired. Do you? I'm not recommending. It's like forever. It's, 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 it's like just does, it's like just works by itself. It's, I don't have to try. You don't have to try. Right. You don't even have to try. The mind will do a good job by itself. What I'm saying is that what makes it difficult is not the actual practice of meditation. What makes it difficult is to do meditation which goes against the mind. If you do meditation which does not go against the mind, it is easy. You make a person sit down to think of the self, you get restless after a while. And you open your eyes and begin chatting with that person, some gossip, especially some scandal about somebody else. You can sit three hours and not get tired. The same body, the same legs, the same muscles will not ache. The same body, which is which couldn't stand that first ordeal in a similar position, in same position, it's absolutely fine. Because you're going along with the mind. So that's the difference. The mind is, don't get worried that the mind is trying to come in the way it is supposed to. Our job is to do our thing. The mind's job is to do its own thing. The mind comes in our way and we do our own thing. The mind knocks, I feel like the mind knocks me down. You know, I feel like, I feel like I'm weak, weakened by it. It does. Then get up again. Try, try again, like the story of the spider. If at first you don't succeed, try again. Or do you know a better method? I think this is a method that works. If at first you don't succeed, try again and try again. Of course, new version, modern age version is, if at first you don't succeed, give up. <laughs> but the old Robert Bruce said the other thing. The mind will constantly put pressure and make it a tiresome activity to do meditation. This is only the beginning. As we go along, even at other stages of development, you'll find that the mind comes in the way. In fact, I had to ask my own master, great master, this question. He said, Master, why do you keep on saying, oh, you'll see such beautiful lights and such goodies and there is so many things. Aren't you trying to bribe, bribe me to go? He says, I'm trying to bribe the mind. It's true. We're trying to put the resistance of the mind to the lowest level by saying, mind, there is something good for you too. If the mind begins to enjoy any part of the spiritual experience, it never comes in the way. It helps you to go along. The difficult stage is when you want the spiritual experience, the mind doesn't enjoy it and becomes a resistance. Once you overcome that stage and both want to enjoy it, you move very rapidly. Which happens. Because the mind enjoys a lot of the experiences too. The difficulty is, while we are willing to try out our seeking because of our loneliness, our nature of the soul and so on, our inner inclination to find the truth is so strong that we want to go in and seek. The mind is not sure, convinced. The mind creates a doubt. The mind says, who knows? How are you sure? I am not sure. I am not willing to take, the, take an unnecessary journey. The mind's resistance is not coming from the absence of attraction for the mind. The mind's resistance is coming from the mind not having been convinced about those goodies there. The moment some good success comes to you, after all the resistance and difficulties, you pass through a hard time, a rough time, and eventually you see some beautiful good scenery there and beautiful experiences and hear such lovely me melodies of music and travel in space and travel in regions and travel at the speed of thought 
and look at astral regions, look at the astral libraries of information, look at past lives, look at Akashic records. Once you start doing even a little bit of that, the mind never comes in the way of your meditation. It runs along with you because mind starts enjoying these very things. The self and the mind both enjoy that kind of experience. But the mind has the resistance to reach that point because of doubt. The mind is not convinced. It not only is not convinced, by identification with the mind, it makes us feel we are not convinced. How are we sure? We speak the language of the mind when we say we are not convinced about it. We just, we just echoing like parrot what the mind is telling us inside. Once you are overcoming that stage, as you've been able to go on to something good, the mind does not give that problem anymore. So all I can say, uh, the positive side of it, the optimistic side is, this resistance is temporary. Okay? Yes. Um, do you think that this kind of thing you can uh, improve the, your mental abilities, like your analytical abilities, that, that side of your mind as well as the intuitive? Absolutely. That helps you focus? And... Absolutely. Right now, we do not make the best use of our mind with its analytical abilities because we do not use it. We are used by it. If you use the mind, you always have better control over its abilities. Right now, what happens is that we having... The mind is like a computer. The mind functions just like a computer. You use the computer for analysis, for programming, and it does exactly what you tell it to do. The mind does nothing on its own. You are the motive force, the life force that makes the mind work is the same soul, the same living energy, the same consciousness. The mind follows what you tell the mind. What has happened over a period of time is the mind in its programming it started telling us what we should be doing. The computer got hold of us. It's one of those dangers which were mentioned in some science fiction movies that one day these robots will come designed by men and then they will give instructions to men and cause destruction of the very creators of the robots. Those uh, people thought that those robots will come and destroy our lives by taking over control. They didn't realize those robots already exist except they exist in the head, biological robots. The brain, functioning as the mind, is a biological robot telling us what to do. When the mind takes the lead in telling us what to do, we are no longer able to make full use of the analytical abilities of the mind. And once we know what the mind is, how it functions, it's for us to use it as we like. And the abilities inherent in the mind, the analytical capabilities, can be used much more efficiently through this meditational practice. You don't lose anything. You gain. Yes, it does. You can remember a lot. Any, any, any expansion of awareness about your own self helps all those different faculties you have, which you use only partially now. And memory is one of them. It helps in all these ways. So it is a, uh, a multi-beneficial scheme. This, uh, this scheme of uh, doing meditation has many benefits. And it depends. Some people start off by looking at one benefit and they move on and find more benefits which they think are more worthwhile. But you can start from anywhere. I have had great experiences with people who wanted to talk of meditation from different standpoints, saying, forget about these inner experiences. Tell me, can meditation help me to reduce my indebtedness? Things like that. Can meditation help me to pay my bills? So, okay, let's start from there. It hardly matters. You start from there and then you find out you can. Because all these questions are dependent upon basically using our conscious faculties. You can make more money. Like Clarence wanted to make a million dollars. Maybe he started meditation for that. I don't know. We are, we are going to see the yogi this evening who Clarence met and said, how, Yogi ji, how did you make your million dollars? Give me the tip. That means he had a desire. He has made the million dollars, but I think without following those tips. I don't know how much meditation he wasted to make the million dollars, but he's happy. So, some people want to make happiness their goal. Million dollars may be a peripheral perk. 
Some people want to make a million dollars. And happiness is just a peripheral perk. Whichever way you start off from, you'll find that having control over your functions and faculties of awareness and consciousness helps in every area. I have yet to be convinced that there is some area in which you lose. I am willing to be convinced. If anybody has evidence that by doing meditation, you gain a lot of things, but you lose also, I'd be happy to know which is the area in which one loses. I had a friend of mine who told me, he said by practicing this, practicing meditation, he was losing his wife. Because the wife didn't believe in this kind of meditation. And she got after him and said that, how can you do it? So he, had, he was a novice, of course, in meditation. That he couldn't uh, deal with the situation meant he was still a novice. His awareness was still growing. But once his awareness grew, today the same friend of mine and his wife are both meditating with having an effect of mutual happiness between them. So it's a question of time. That is why I cannot say that I have really found evidence that by taking on meditation, you really lose. You do lose worry. But that's not an asset. I don't think anybody considers worry an asset. You lose fear. I don't think that's an asset either. Some people question that. By the way, uh, I come from a school, Harvard, where we don't take anything for granted, no assumptions. Uh, why, how can I make a dogmatic statement that worry and fear are not assets? Maybe it is worry and fear that has led to progress in civilization. Maybe, maybe it is the people who are bothered by these things that have led to greater invention and technology. How can you suddenly dismiss I'm from that school? So I, I have even argued with people who think maybe worry has a role to play. Generally, we say that worry and fear are the cause of more of unhappiness and negative experiences in life than positive. And we certainly get rid of worry and fear in meditation. Indeed, I do not know any other practice in this world which retains your clarity of perception, of analysis, and makes you fearless. Except this. I have not come across any better way Every other way that I examined, while introducing clarity and greater vision and greater awareness, created greater anxiety and fear and greater worry. What could happen? There's so new possibilities coming to light. So fearlessness did not come by following any other track. That is why I'm open to examine these things. If somebody has, uh, has something to offer on this, it's an interesting subject. That what are we giving up? All right, I gave up. I didn't give up, but some people gave up. Clarence gave up meat. He, he, he misses, maybe he misses his steaks. Maybe he misses those hot dogs. I don't know. But all I know is he produced the Darwinian things and the Socratic burgers and the Darwinian, uh, what is that? Darwinian burger. And, and not only did he enjoy these substitutes of the meats, He's made so many other people happy because of that. And had he not got into this meditational technique, he would still be eating the same old heavily cholesterol loaded, uh, ill health giving old meat, uh, real meat stuff. And nor would he have shared this with anybody else. Took, uh, uh, taking the whole picture together, I think he did well. Do you miss your me uh, meat, Clarence? No. No, no, be honest. <laughs> you, I mean, it is for those th for those who miss it. So uh, I have tried to look at it from different points of view. What have we given up? What have we given up, which we can say is a price we have to pay for getting these benefits of meditation? I don't think we give up much, except we give up the mind's doubts and fears, and that's no big asset. Okay, we'll have a final session of meditation going within. Please follow this up later on. Don't leave it with the workshop. The workshop is just an indicator of what is possible. The workshop is not the only experience you have with these things. The workshop tells you this is possible. Go ahead with it. When you're seeking, get strong you automatically meet perfect living master by coincidence in your life. 
and things move on in a different frame and different dimension from there. Let that happen by itself. Don't have expectations. Don't look forward to things. Just learn to be with yourself and learn to know who you are within, without expectation. All the things that you have been expecting will come. But if you start expecting things, they will not come. That's strange law of strange law of the nature of expectation, which really means the nature of the mind. So close your eyes, use all the techniques that you know of, including a technique of identification with the beloved through the process of love. If you love somebody, identify with the beloved at the third eye center and see if that helps you to withdraw faster. Because the process of love with identification is actually the same as meditation. Any last minute questions before we close the workshop? Yes. When you were younger and you were not so long, did you also run into any problems? Oh, yeah. Are you asking me? <laughs> you bet. Problems are always there. We run into problems all the time. Problems have to be taken care of. And I'm reminded of that story I've been telling of Dr. Tind of California, how he recommended what we should do with the problems. He thought problems is not a serious thing. The way we handle problems is the serious thing. And he thought the reason why we are so bothered with problems and worried about problems is that we don't meet them. We try to skirt around, try to avoid them, try to put them off. We don't meet them head on. So his method was, if you have a problem, First meet it, I was first greet it, then meet it, then beat it. He says, tell the problem, come on, here I am. Take the problem head on. Whatever the solution, meet it and just deliver it. Don't say, I have a problem, let me put it off for today. Put it the more we put off these problems, the worse they get. And the more we skirt around these problems, the worse they get. Nobody has been ever helped, to the best of my knowledge, in trying to avoid a problem that is right in front. Best is to take on head on, deal with it and finish with it. Problems do come. Deal with them very forcefully. It's our own weakness, our own inner fear that doesn't let us meet the problems. Do more meditation, you'll become fearless. Problems will be no problem. You'll be able to deal with the problems fearlessly. And also use the eighth sense also. You know the senses. Some may not have heard of the eight senses. They, normally people talk of five senses. The five senses of perception. Seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, smelling are the five senses of perception. All human beings have them. The animals have less, they say. I don't know. But uh, these five senses appear apparently all human beings have. But what makes a human being exceptional are not these senses. What makes him exceptional is the sixth sense. The sixth sense is called sixth sense and refers to intuition. A person who can use his hunch to advantage is at an advantage over all other people with the same senses. So one should use the sixth sense wherever necessary. The seventh sense is even more important than the sixth. And that is common sense. And it's very uncommon. It's common sense that tells us the priorities between choices we have. Sometimes we just start thinking, should I do this or should I do that? Because we have no notion. What is the grain? What is the chaff? We do not know how to set our priorities right. You'll be amazed that if a person sat down one day, let me put my priorities right. 90% of the problems of life are finished that day. Everything follows smoothly from those priorities. We keep on changing our priorities because we don't know what is important, what is not. The common sense is the seventh sense that makes us keep our priorities straight. But the best sense continues to be the eighth sense. And that is the sense of humor. The ability to laugh. Laugh at everything. Laugh at your own situation. Laugh at what's going on. Look at the world as a show. That ability to laugh and have the sense of humor helps you. So all eight senses should be used to deal with problems. You'll have no problem. Yes. So Clarence, that tip of yours still applicable even today after 20 years. Don't worry, don't worry about things over which you have no control. That's right. We generally worry about things over which we have no control. And we are afraid of things which never happen. I've seen that people, I told people, 
list down the 12 things of which you are really afraid may happen and they list them down and after five years you ask them how many came to pass not even one or two so they were uselessly wasting their capacity to be afraid on things that were never happening so we 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 worry about things that over which we have no control and we fear are afraid of things that will never happen yes anybody here anybody else wants to share anything before we clo close the workshop okay thank you very much friends for joining me in this workshop here on uh, accessing the self and i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did this was uh, a first program of uh, the institute for the study of human awareness in albuquerque we hope we'll have some more program depends on paul he's our <laughs> local audience so paul you saw that if you set up a program anywhere there are enough people willing to travel to create an audience for the program <laughs> we come from all over the country here but i think people wanted to see this part of the country and enjoy it and uh, i hope you will not be disappointed with uh, new mexico and this evening for that very reason i have accepted an invitation from yogi bhajan uh, siri singh saab from espanola to go and visit him there and you can see his ranch he was keen that we should leave early so we can see in the daylight uh, part of the ranch so if it is possible should we make the departure at 4:30 instead of 5 i have some interviews to do i can finish the, them by 4:30 and leave then we'll come back early also we'll be able to see uh, espanola by day and the mountains also bye bye <laughs>